All right. Uh, the first thing I want to kind of start off with was to get a sense of how each of you ended up at your school coaching both men and women. So, Craig, you go back a bit further. So why don't we start off with you? Okay. Um, originally, so back in 1997, uh, the position was part-time um, part men's volleyball and full-time women's volleyball, full-time women's basketball. So that was one position. Uh, so there was a separate coach there coaching basketball and women's volleyball. I coached the men part-time for three years, and then our AD took a, um, a pretty big leap by, by taking a basketball position that's full-time and cutting down uh, that position to part-time. So women's basketball went full-time back down to part-time and made volleyball full-time, which was kind of new, I think, for that time. You know, it was, it was 2000, 2000, and she did that. So it wasn't uh, necessarily a popular decision for a lot of basketball enthusiasts and uh, general, you know, how things are supposed to go in the, in the scheme of things. So, uh, so from 2000 on, I've been full-time with both the men and the women. Okay. Uh, had you coached the women before? I had not. I had coached high school. So I was actually coaching uh, Pelham High School. Is uh, Pelham, New Hampshire is a town uh, mm -hmm. about 15 minutes away from Riviera. And I had coached them while I was coaching the men as well. So it was part-time okay. at a high school, part-time at, uh, at Riviera. Gotcha. Okay. All right. What about you, Nikki? I started with the women here. I'm from the St. Louis area, so I moved back home in 2010. Had no idea what I wanted to do, but I think all along I was destined to be a coach. Um, I got the assistant job for the women in 2011, and they knew I volunteered coach club uh, with boys and men uh, at a local NAI program and the local club here, and they're like, hey, how about you start a men's program can you get 18 athletes by the spring? And this was in December of 2013. <laughs> <laughs> so um, lots of blood, sweat, and tears into getting those kids coming here. And they were all freshmen. So we got 17 freshmen in that first class. Um, and, yeah, I made it happen that, that first year. And then I, I know we were originally going to be – kind of club independent, but after talking to some of my, my counterparts, they're like, you need to just be apply to be in the Mevo right away. Why wait? Like, why would you, um, do so, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I went to the administration and they're like, let's go. So there you are. So okay. you were, you had, you had become the, the head women's coach by this point, by the point that you started. The oh, yes. I, Actually, I became interim head coach mid-season, um, let's see, mid-season 20, yeah, 2013, or 2012, and I took over in October, and then after the end of that season, they were like, we like what you're doing, we like you, how about you coach both? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Uncharted territory, uh, trying to balance out what that looks like. Um, and, again, it was um, my predecessor was removed mid-season. So I took over, and then I was, like, stressed out with that. And I'm like, okay, I still have to recruit these guys. And it was just myself and my assistant at the time mm -hmm. trying to, to hustle. And, um, yeah. It was a, a trying time. 2013 wasn't my year. Hey, the school said that they liked you, but did you really have that feeling once they offered you that? <laughs> I was like, sure. <laughs> yes, I think you do. I think, I think I, I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those uh, who might watch this and, and not be aware of my own background, uh, I had uh, coached uh, women's, almost exclusively women's, had a little bit of a stint helping out with boys volleyball in my old high school way, way back, um, was a, a club player at the University of Rhode Island when I was a student there. But from a college coaching perspective and a juniors coaching perspective, I'd done all girls and, and women uh, at the JUCO level, at the D1 level. When I went to England was the first time I coached 
men at the college level. And I was coaching both. It was, it was, you know, kind of sort of similar to, you know, your situations in that there was kind of one idea when I went in and then it kind of morphed into another idea before too much longer. Uh, the, I kind of gotten there on the, Hey, would you mind helping out sort of, <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, and I was like, yeah, okay, fine. No problem. And I had this deal with another guy, who, another American guy, actually, who'd, who'd been working with the teams prior to this. And so we kind of decided, all right, he'll lead coach the men, I'll assist. I'll lead coach the women, he'll assist. I didn't know at the time that he wasn't going to be able to make all the practices. He wasn't going to go to any of the matches. <laughs> maybe, maybe he'd be able to come to some of the home matches. So I'm like, oh, so real fast, I'm like, okay, basically I'm the lead coach of everybody, and he turns up sometimes. Uh, all right. <laughs> and, and here we go. <laughs> so okay. it's, yeah, it's a, it's it definitely uh, interesting to be thrown in kind of at the deep end like that sometimes. Um, Nikki, how about we start with you in terms of what does your, what does your schedule look like during the semester, I imagine they're basically mirrors of each other in that you've got one team in season and one team off season and you're kind of having to juggle both of them at the same time. Um, I, I feel like I have it down to a science now. <laughs> um, we have since the women always went early in the morning. Um, so the team that's in season goes six to nine AM. The team that's out of season goes nine to 11. Um, and I'm usually out of the office by like three o'clock if not earlier um, I have two children so I have to have some kind of balance um, but when it comes to like actual schedule uh, the women compete in the GLDC and they always play Friday Saturday which there is not really any overlap ex except for maybe in the later of the fall and our scrimmaging but all of our scrimmages happen to be Sunday and I thank you Miva coaches for accommodating um, I appreciate that and then uh, in the spring it's we're pretty liberal on the men's side as far as scheduling and obviously having to work around basketball and um, things like that. So I have the ability to, I don't want to say move as I see fit, but I have the ability, ability to make certain adjustments as long as coaches agree. So it helps with recruiting. It helps with, you know, the women's scheduling, making sure neither team feels slighted, but at least that five hour block of volleyball is designated in the morning and then no one wants to practice at 6 a.m. So I'm glad that I don't have to fight for it because um, I don't want to practice in the afternoon. So I think that works out pretty well. Yeah, that's that's interesting because uh, certainly a lot of teams will do spring, uh, women's teams, for example, do spring practice early in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't normally hear about teams doing early morning practice during season. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, how, you're getting how does in, that getting feel? out. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I fully, I'm an early, early person to begin with, so I would love a schedule like that. But how does that feel in terms of translating into playing when obviously you're playing mostly in the evenings? Okay. Um, we haven't seen that much, you know, there's no neg really negative effects as far as what I've seen so far because our, the way our schedule works out is they, um, Monday and Tuesday are about the Cats, Wednesday and Thursday – are about our opponent and then we also will scale back to say Thursday pre-match uh, you know we play Friday we're going to go 7 to 8 30 hopefully normally they would be waking up by 7 anyway because of class um well well that's a whole nother topic um <laughs> and they're in and out and they're going so this is it's, it's not I haven't had them any adverse effects. It's more like now I'm an early bird all the time and that's now part of their daily routine. And even on game day, you know, do your routine, make sure you're getting up at your, I don't want to say normal time at that time, six o'clock, getting up, eating breakfast, take a nap if you need to keep your daily routine. Um, but then we have serve and pass at three thirty, both teams every pre-match and kind of keep that same routine. So year to year, it's, it's a natural occurrence. And they they're pretty used to it. Okay, interesting. All right, Craig, you you have the addition of some administrative duties. So, how does that play into all the, all the scheduling for you? Uh, horribly. Um, so, for me, it's a little different than 
than uh, what Nikki was saying. So we had, we ran a lot of things afternoon, evening. Afternoon usually would be uh, maybe a four to six or a six to eight. And then when basketball was in, it would be an eight to 10 or a nine to 11 practice. So that was, uh, it's nice in the fall, you have the women are only ones in the gym. So we would generally have our pick of four to six or six to eight, depending upon the class schedules. So that kind of ran um, similar to what they were doing every day with their classes and the games being at, at night in the evening. We didn't really have to um, overly stress out about being up early in the morning as far as practicing and having their, their schedule be similar for game days. Um, once uh, the men, I, I've tried different ways. I've tried uh, having the men's non-traditional season uh, at the same time of the year. Uh, so either September or October during a women's season and did just didn't that didn't really go well with me so I generally would have the women's season would start the women's season would finish and then I would jump right into uh, the men's non-traditional season for a few weeks so we would literally be coming <laughs> driving back on on a Saturday after a championship game and if we won then the guys would get postponed for another two weeks because of the NCAA tournament if we lost and we started that fall on Monday and and jumped right in with them uh, in like middle of November. Um, for the the spring, same thing. I would have the guys, and because of the gym availability with the basketball teams going as well, the women would basically we would um, hold them off until about um, later in March or April, usually after spring break at some point, and then do a few weeks with them. Um, I had again tried you know, it, try to get them to go during the same part of the season. And the guy's season goes through mid-April, obviously, so it, they're going to be crossing over at that point with the non-traditional, the women, and, and the regular season for the guys. But I had to stagger it. Like, I was getting to a point where um, it was very hard to go from the speed and the power of the guys to not quite as much speed and, and power of the women, and they're coming off of, you know, not, not getting as many touches since uh, November, basically, right? So a little rusty and a little behind on things. So for me, it was, that was challenging mentally uh, and just draining. Cause we were going, like I said, we had practices that were going at nine, 11 at night. I'd get back, you know, to my house by midnight, back at work by nine or 10 in the morning to do administrative things and then set up a day for the rest of the practices and, and go from there. So it, it gets to be long, you know, and my, my AD is awesome. Like she understands, um, you know, she, she values me obviously as a, as an associate athletic director, but she also understands the success of the programs um, is dependent upon how fresh I am, so to speak. So she takes a lot of uh, things on her plate um, when not, when I'm in a busy point. Okay. Um, when I was coaching in England, uh, the, the structure there is different than it is in the States. And this applies probably most places outside the U.S. where the seasons are concurrent. There is no breakout between men's and women's seasons. You pretty much much start in about October and finish probably March uh, for the university leagues and so I, I, w I would literally have women's practice then men's practice right on the back of it so fairly similar to what Nikki has, is doing um, schedule wasn't quite as intense because it wasn't a, an everyday sort of thing one of the, the real tricky bits was who to prioritize when it came to matches and it would, you know, we would kind of make a decision at the beginning of the season which team we would, we would make the priority for me to actually attend uh, if there was a conflict. There weren't a ton of conflicts, but it did, it did come up from time to time. Um, the thing I want to clarify for people who, who may not be aware, uh, Craig, why don't you talk about what non-traditional season means for Division Three? Sure. Uh, so non-traditional season is basically the off-season for – uh, for the team. So for the women's volleyball, their regular season is in the fall. You know, it runs basically September through November. Um, our non-traditional season for the men who are in the spring, we would have a non-traditional season, which basically is a, a certain amount of dates set by the NCAA. Uh, it, it usually, for round purposes, it usually fits in about three weeks um, where, where I can actually coach and pre uh, coach practices with the teams. For Division Three, anything outside the non-traditional season, we're hands off. It's all the kids have to be uh, self-motivated to you know get in the weight room and, and do things on their own and, and do extra skill reps on their own. Um, but during the non-traditional season, 
that that's the time that we're able to get a few more weeks of, of practice and touches in with the with the teams and be able to coach them. Um, so again, so the women's is in the fall. That's their regular season. Their non-traditional season is in the spring, where they'll do three weeks or so with with myself. The men's seasons in the spring. Their non-traditional seasons in the uh, fall, where, where they'll do three weeks or so with with myself. Right, and you're basically allowed what sixteen dates, one of which could be competition. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. Now in Division Two, as Nikki can explain, off season actually is split into two pieces. Right. So the women have a championship and non championship se championship segment um, where we have to declare our days, but it's around forty five days in the spring. Um, but again, we have it timed out to where you know the men season we're starting at January first. <laughs> you know, the regular student population doesn't get back till um, probably January 15th. We don't even start with the women until February. Um, and I think the, the beauty of Division Two is, you know, there's a lot of work-life balance where we're not even, oh, in, in that time from February to spring break, which is around March, second week of March, we're in our eight hours. So we can have team, individual team or skill um, during that time, uh, eight hours a week, and that, or that also includes weightlifting. And then after that, after spring break, we're going 20 hours. But that also is case dependent on the men's season. Uh, we don't practice on Fridays with the men if there's a women game day, because uh, I also don't want to wake up and I'm there from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's just not conducive to success. Um, the same thing with the women. If the men are have a game day. We will adjust practice time to say men last year played Thursday, Saturday. We would not have women's practice on Thursday morning. We would do it maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so that calendar is always revolving. So that, again, I agree with Craig that best way you get me is fresh. Um, there have been a handful of times where we've had to get off the road with the women and get on a bus with the men, literally hop off, hop on, but that's really few and far between, and that's twice a year in, in the fall, maybe. Um, but, you know, and then the women also end right during men's championship, uh, like the MEBA championship time. So they've played their three to four competition dates, and we can still, you know, the way we prioritize here is the end season team has priorities. So if there is a conflict, I will stay with the end season team, and that just makes it easy instead of, you know, oh, you're picking favorites because you're going with this team or that team. Um, end season team always has priority. They get me full, full go. Not saying the other team does not, but definitely it makes it a lot easier if there is conflict during that time. Right. So from a staffing perspective, Nikki, uh, how, how do you have your assistant coaches allocated? Uh, we all do both. The continuity is that much easier. Um, I, I have a full-time assistant and a GA, um, and we also have a, a volunteer that can come whenever they can. Um, it makes it much easier instead of, of course, I think in a perfect world, I'd say, oh, I want an assistant for this team, an assistant for that team, and a GA, you know, but we have our own constraints at the Division Two level, and it, it works out really well. Um, with the kids both know us, um, there's no... You know, oh, I don't know what that person did today or the organization of both the programs. We're all in the now, um, and we're a, a very organized group to make sure, again, that nothing's getting missed. Um, and it, it, it also, like I said, helps with the relationship with the players. Um, they know if I'm not there, you know, Christian, my assistant, he's first in command. So he's an extension of me, so you got to make sure you respect him the same. So it, it makes it, re I don't want to say easy, but a little bit easier. Right. What about you, Craig? Uh, so this is uh, for us. <laughs> um, so we have, I have a part-time assistant for both teams. So two separate positions. They make peanuts. So they're doing it either because they love me or they just love to coach the game, one of the two. So for my men's team right now, it's a really good friend of mine. He's got a full-time job working 40 hours a week. Um, and then my women's team uh, is actually the, the local club uh, down the road. He's an alumni of mine. 
and he's actually my assistant, but his full-time position is running that club. So he has a bit more flexibility. Um, but it's I've had seasons where I haven't had assistants. I've had seasons, um, you know, where my assistants come two or three days a week uh, just for either because it's time constraints um, from when we have to practice and they can't make it or it's something with their job and uh, things just don't work out that way. So it's hard because the – the pay that they get is literally pennies for the amount of time they, that they put in. So it's me asking them to do something, they would do it, you know what I mean, without me asking. But I feel like, all right, you're not making anything. Like I can handle three days a week of not having you there and, and uh, I can run everything myself. So it's a little different monster from that. Uh, we don't have GAs. Um, which, you know, is extremely helpful, I think, to have. And we've tried to push that year after year, year after year, and that hasn't happened. So it's a lot of hands-on by myself with um, just really – it always seems to be I have some alumni that will stay on a couple of years after because they're in the area and they help out and then kind of move on from there. Um, so that's – for me, it's pretty thin coaching staff. Do you have um... – do you have the opposite team members help out at all, like as as managers or just yeah. practice helpers or anything like that? Yeah. So that's a that's kind of a big selling point for me for getting sometimes getting recruits in because it's a matter of you know you can sit on the bench, and especially for recruits that maybe want to become coaches down the road. We had pretty good success with having you know our alumni go on and, and coach elsewhere. So it's been um, a good point where we can have, you know, you come in, you can be on the bench with us, you can listen to what we're saying and, and really kind of help out with a manager role. Um, practices, they can't do anything now with Division Three. When I, when I first started, they could go a couple days, you know, for, for the men could practice with the women. The women could practice with the men, but it, it, that wasn't uh, beneficial at the time for us. Um, but now the rule has changed that it's a season of eligibility if you practice, you know, with the, your off-season team. Um, it's more of just um, helping out, you know, on the road and just being managers and uh, very helpful for game situations as well where it's, you know, they're running the film, um, you know, and just kind of keeping everything in line during the home games as well, kind of event managers and having them run things. What about you, Nikki? Any, any crossover like that? Um, for us, um, it is actually – we have some of the guys come to practice because um, sometimes they have 8 a.m. And only thing for us in Division Two is that it will count towards their 20 hours. So if I, I had a, a young man who couldn't practice with the team on Wednesdays, he'd come to women's practice and, you know, help out, and that would count towards his uh, 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, it's few and far between. I invite them. I would love for them to come all the time because it just makes the gym that much more competitive. Um, but not necessarily in the capacity of managers. Um, we do have quite a, at least a few from either team that would like to coach potentially in the future, um, but just time constraints and their schedules don't allow it. But on game day, uh, they are required to be there or for the most part, and they help warm up. Uh, the guys, mainly, they hang out on the bench all the time. And uh, the girls do the same, but I'm like, you guys have to go. You have to leave right now. You can't keep sitting here. <laughs> but it makes it a lot easier that, you know, we have additional game management help. Um, they're helping with warm-up. They're making sure that no one's getting hurt um, during hitting lines and things like that. But, it's you know, it's pretty cohesive as far as, like, you want to come to practice? Let's go. So. Okay. Uh, related to staffing, uh, since you've both talked about how you've got some severe limitations, recruiting obviously has to be a significant challenge because you guys are with your teams all the time. There's not mm -hmm. much time outside of your seasons for you to get out on the road and go watch kids. So, Nikki, I'll start with you. How do you handle that? Uh, there's a lot of times where I will send either our GA or my assistant, just go. Like, you're going to have to leave. So it's I can handle the practice gym by myself if there's two of us. Um, obviously, with any coach, it's not ideal, but you have to make do with what you have. So if it's a, a close event, I um, mean, we also have to prioritize our time because, you know, everyone has budget constraints, and 
what, what's more beneficial? Where are we mostly getting our kids from? Um, so we're not going to go to XYZ tournament if that's not traditionally somewhere where we're, we've gotten kids. Um, and then, of course, making sure that we're attending our national events like junior nationals, AUs. Um, it's, it's kind of a balancing act. There's a, a lot of times where, you know, I will slowly go by myself. Um, and then I'll leave them here depending on how imp the level of importance with the recruit. Um, I've done several, you know, home visits where it's like, okay, I have to get on a plane or drive a car to go do something. But that's just the nature of the beast where they have to understand that I, you know, you're, you're the face. You, you have to go do mm -hmm. certain things and you have to, you know, schedule that out. But I have to let the teams know in advance that I won't be there. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're like, where are you going? Why are you leaving? It's just, it's just like like my my son. He's like, why are you leaving? Why are you leaving me? You don't love me anymore. What's wrong? Why I, I, you should be here? <laughs> so that's how they treat me. But that's kind of how how it works here. Okay, and Craig, I, I, I imagine it helps having an assistant who's tied in with the juniors network pretty well. Yeah. So I mean, so he's been with us for four years now. So that's been beneficial. Um, especially in the guy's side, that's definitely um, cut down a lot of my travel for, for things. Um, you know, I mean, basically when I first started, it was you go to clubs, tournaments. You know, I didn't see anything in season, you know, for high school games really. It was basically recruiting from, um, you know, November through January for both teams and trying to hit up as many of the club tournaments as possible to get kind of the most numbers uh, for your money of being there. Um, a lot of phone calls. It's funny because, um, you know, now with, with COVID, everything is all video right now with, with all players, right? And and, uh, and that's kind of what how I was a long time ago where it was, you know, like, I, you know, love your game, but here's my schedule that I, I can't make any of your games. So you have video, send video, and then it's just constantly reiterating. Um, like your players, you got to tell them you love them you know, 19 times a practice. So it's, you know, love you, love you, love you. Can't come and see you, but we still want you here to play for us. So, you know, and if the rare moment that you get out and see them play, then that was a bonus, but it's definitely, um, it's connections. It's making, you know, connections with the clubs and having that relationship with the, the coaches that you trust in those clubs. Uh, and again, like obviously having uh, one of our alumni having that club is definitely beneficial where, it cuts down some things for us, um, but we still want to try to get players outside the area as well. So um, having him as, as eyes at tournaments that he goes to, you know, he can at least jot down numbers and then we can reach out to the different clubs that we see and say, you know, number so-and-so was caught our eye, you know, we'd love to have a conversation with her and then stop that process from there. So it's, it's interesting because one of my alumni is um, coach at Western Connecticut uh, University Division Three program in Connecticut, and he just constantly busts my chops that he, that he never sees me recruiting. <laughs> so I think it's more because he's frustrated because he's out there doing it all the time. But I think for me, it's just having that relationship with the club coaches and being able to get the students to understand that um, because I'm not there doesn't mean that it's it's any less of uh, a moment that we don't want them there. It's just we don't have that opportunity. So that's really a one-on-one -on -one conversation right away that we love you. We may not see you seven times, uh, you know, in the next three months like like a lot of other coaches. So it's worked out. Yeah. All right. Let's um, – I want to talk about culture a bit. And I'm curious how you guys address it in terms of whether you look at it in a unified fashion with the both teams together, or if you kind of handle them separately. And, and, and Craig, why don't we start with you on that one? Unequivocally, it is they are together. Um, for me, that's the, the very first thing I did back in 2000 was that I, I wanted to incorporate a family type atmosphere. And so we basically call it a second family atmosphere. So it's, it's something where it's not the men's team, it's not the women's team, it's Riviera Volleyball. Uh, and so your decisions and, and all the things that you talk about with one team instead of affecting decisions that you make as a player, instead of affecting 20 people, it's now affecting 40 people. Um, and so we do, you know, a lot of things off the court together as teams. 
um, to make sure that we still have that balance of being one big family uh, on campus. They're eating, you know, lunch and dinner together. There's one big area in the calf that people kind of know, like that's the volleyball area, not by us like claiming it, but it just kind of happens, you know. And, and so year after year, there's always, you know, a huge group of people eating there, and, and everybody else is welcomed, obviously. But it turns out it's you know it's 30 volleyball players having having lunch and dinner together, uh, and we really kind of um, we rally around it really. I mean that's kind of the culture that we've we've developed from a long time ago, and and, and it certain type of players and, and people like that culture, you know. So that's a that's a recruiting draw for us, um, you know, and, and it allows us to be able to it helps recruiting wise. Obviously, where again, where I'm not able to get out as much, but when they come on the campus, they see this thing that's just impressive as far as how tight-knit the groups are and how tight-knit all 40 people are together. And it takes a certain person to get here, too. So recruiting-wise, it's this is our culture. Do you fit in this or not? And if you don't, then it's not it's not a right or wrong answer. We just don't want you here. We want people that are going to be able to fill in uh, with this culture seamlessly and carry it on for the next four years and hand it off to the teams, that, to the players that come in for the following teams, following years. Um, so – being one big family has been a massive culture uh, environment for us. Okay. What about you, Nikki? Um, we're a little bit different. I am ultimately the matriarch of both teams. So there is, you know, there is the men's team, there is the women's team, but they both, um, they both conspire against me like children. It's fine. And they, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, they're, they're a great group. Um, and I, I share Craig's sentiment that it is a family. So when I say the matriarch, I, I wear many hats, just not as the coach. Um, and it, it's funny because as any of your athletes, they're not the same. You know, I, I get a lot of questions of like, so how are the guys? I'm like, they're a bunch of big babies. That's what they are. That's, that's how I see them. Um, they're, except for their six, seven, six, eight, they're big people, but they need the exact TLC as you would think the women's team does. It's just a little. It's there's little difference. There's not um, this big contrast. Um, they they communicate actually really well. I have a sibling pair, uh, a sister on the women's team and a brother on the men's team. I've had siblings through the program. Um, and it's kind of funny to hear, like, because they practice back to back. Like, so how's Nikki today? Is she happy? Is she angry? What is going on? Um, but it, we're, we're the same. There's a area in the cafeteria where there's a, you know, it's a volleyball, you know, and I think we kind of share that area with soccer. And again, not because we claimed it, but it's just naturally gravitated into that, to that spot. Um, but culture is huge for us. Um, I trust them implicitly, especially when it comes to recruiting and we bring uh, uh, young men and women on campus. They need to tell me the truth of how they fit into this group. Uh, they could be the best player in the world, but if they don't fit, you know, what we're doing here, then I will gladly tell them no. And I, and I, they all understand that. And not to mention just trying to mold and shape minds of, you know, both my, both the personalities, if that was a different question, the personalities of the team are similar, but, you know, of when it comes down to, you know, are they together a lot? No, I don't necessarily force that hand but because it naturally happens and they get the same rules, the same information. They train the same. Obviously there's physical differences, but there's nothing that someone's getting a leg up Someone might get me on a nicer day, and that's the only thing. But other than that, um, they're they're treated pretty much the same. Okay, uh, just for those who might be interested, the structure overseas is is all club, almost exclusively club. There's some tweaks to that in certain UK universities, where they have what they call performance programs that are actually scholarship driven, and there's a bit more resources, more akin to what we would call a varsity program. But generally speaking, it's, it's a club structure. So when I was coaching at Exeter, all of the, the players were part of a big, the big volleyball club, only a fraction of whom were actually the competitive players who, that, I, that I coached. 
and that was probably what uh, maybe 35 of them all together between both teams. And there was like another 70 that were members of the club at lower levels of participation. We had a big intermediates group and they kind of played a bit in the city league for recreation. And we had some people who were in the beginners group that were just kind of learning the game. Uh, but they were all part of that organization. They all did things together. They had social functions and, and, and all the, the stuff that you would expect of being a club. And then once you talked about the competitive teams, what we call the Bucks teams, because Bucks is their equivalent of the NCAA, there was a kind of an additional layer of camaraderie because obviously they're now they're all doing the extra training. They know what the experience of being that higher level, more committed athlete is like. And I, I really enjoyed that cohesiveness between the groups, which isn't to say they always got along. Because yeah. there were times when, say, the women didn't really respect the guys because they felt like the guys were slacking off or, you know, weren't focused or whatever. Um, and you're going to have that sort of thing that, that happens sometimes because they, they, they do have different perspectives on things. Uh, but when it came down to, you know, match time, they were always super supportive of each other to the extent that at the time they were doing what we, what they called final eights, whereas there was a first knockout round of playoffs, a uh, round of 16, and then the surviving eight went and did a pool play event. And it was both the men and women at the same event where they would, so basically they would do two rounds of women raise the nets, two rounds of men, lower the nets, et cetera, through the day. So we were one of, I think, my second year there, we were one of maybe four schools that had both teams there together. And our group was by far the loudest and rowdiest in support of each other to the point that I, apparently, and I was, of course, I, I was coaching all the time, so I didn't get to hear what was going on in the stands or anything like that. But there were some people grumbling that we were a little too enthusiastic. In a, in a good way. I'm going to take it in a good way. But that's one of the negatives is <laughs> here I am in Edinburgh, which is where the tournament was. I had never been to Edinburgh. Who gets no time to go out and see the city? The coach. <laughs> because he's got to coach the men in their morning pool play, and the women are off doing their touristy thing. And, the, yeah. and then the women come in and do their pool, and, you know, the guys are off doing all right, so I get to see the bus ride back and forth from the hotel to to the, the center where we were playing. Um, but it was still a lot of fun. We, we were all together on the bus that, you know, went up there and came back, and, and they had a good time with it, you know, even though we were driving back through the – I think we left at, like, 9 o'clock at night after we got done playing on Sunday and rolled back into Exeter. It was, like, like 6 in the morning. So yeah, that was, that was enjoyable. Um, so I, that that whole thing has kind of appealed to me about how the two the two programs can kind of play off each other and and be unified in certain ways. I feel uh, like the volleyball thing too. I'm not sure other teams and it's different coaches, I guess. Where you know men's soccer is coached by somebody different than women's soccer, but I just feel like volleyball in general, the way the club scene is, and I feel it has that natural camaraderie for whoever plays volleyball. You know, and, and mm -hmm. such a small family out there anyways that I think it fits for schools that want to do something like that. I think it really it fits well. Well, I have to imagine that the fact that we're not in the same season together, at least in the States, like yeah. basketball yeah. is or soccer is or whatever, they're all really wrapped up in their own season at the time and traveling on different schedules and things like that. So it's not quite as conducive. Yep. Uh, but I'm curious uh, – it sounds like, Craig, you, you, you do this more intentionally, but uh, this is kind of a, a question for both of you. What are the sorts of things that you, you might do in combined fashion, whether maybe it's community service or fundraising efforts, uh, whatever, that, that's intended to support both programs and not just one or the other? Um, so for us, we, you know, the, the school is big for service, so it's, it's definitely a lot of things that we'll do together throughout – uh, the whole school year, you know, both seasons, um, you know, for, for kids, um, for charities in the local area, uh, just a lot of different things. And, he, and near Riviere, we'll combine for Riviere Volleyball, we'll do together, as well as with the whole university or the whole athletic department as well. Um, as far as um, trying to uh, go out and get the cohesiveness of the teams together, we'll do just simple things. We have just you know, first three Fridays, 
Um, in September, we have uh, kind of a mandated by me dinner at the CAF, and um, it's for an hour long, and every 10 minutes I tell people to get up and switch their seats so they meet all the new people and kind of just have different conversations with people that they haven't maybe met yet or, or haven't really had full conversations with. So um, that's one that kind of goes over pretty well. Uh, you know, and then the teams do a really good job at um, keeping their focus as far as being that group where they're doing, um, you know, going apple picking together on off Sunday or they're, you know, having Secret Santa and on the holidays or even just the fact that you have kids that are, we're in New Hampshire, we have kids from California and, you know, if you're going home, let's take the kid from California and show him a different part of the country, you know, in Rhode Island, let's say where I live. And so the, the teams really do, and again, I think it's, um, it's who we recruit, you know, they, they understand and get what we're trying to, to do here, and that's be uh, that type of family. So they really do a lot for each other without me even really having to incorporate things. Now, I think it's been handed down over the years after doing this for 24 years. I think it's, it, we had to set the structure and then it just kind of rolled, you know, and has been handed down year after year. So it's been nice that way. But the, the big thing with the, the charities are kind of set. Like we do certain things, one, one's in September, one's in October, and one's in November, and one's December. So it's actually four separate things to start the year off that – whether it's walking for cancer. Um, and that kind of started because one of our players' mom had breast cancer. So that has continued to, to continue for us as a team for a bunch of years now. Um, holiday baskets for Thanksgiving, like I said, the Secret Santa and, and doing um, picking up toys for kids, toys for tots in the area. And, and that's also an athletic department for us uh, activity as well. So it's carried on pretty well. Okay. Anything on your end, Nikki? Um, mainly on our side, uh, we do a lot of fundraising together. Um, uh, camps, they're pretty cohesive as far as, like, okay, we'll do a grade school camp. Both Someone from each team is going to be there. Um, and then the same thing with the fundra- fundraising part of it. The community, ser- community service aspect, um, we have a quite a few individuals on our team, team that that is something that they're passionate about. So it, it's, again, like what we were previously talking about, like it's not a separation. It's who wants to be involved. Like, okay, we're doing Special Olympics. Like, okay, we're, I'm reaching out to both teams. Um, and I'm only the mediator. I, I am not necessarily always a facilitator because I think it's very important for them to take some of the action in their own hands because um, they're, they're, you're an adult. You're not always going to have, you know, someone – overseeing you to get things going and kind of being a starter. So it's really nice these past, you know, years that we've had young women and men that take some of the responsibility, not necessarily away from me as far as an organizer, but saying, hey, I'm doing this. I'm passionate about the Special Olympics. Here are the teams that are working, or here are the people from the teams that are working. Um, This is what we're doing. Um, What is your input? And that is really, really helpful. And, again, that goes back to the time management aspect of it um, because we do have some pretty assured, self-motivated young men and women that can keep that going. Okay. It's pretty interesting to see, I'm sure, sure Nikki, when you – I don't know if, if freshmen come in right away and do that or do they kind of sit back and say, well, I was a leader in high school, but I'm going to sit back now. But you see them kind of move as sophomores and juniors and really start to take the, the balls and kind of run with them and organize things I think, more? I think it's case by case. Um, I, I'll just talk about this year in particular. We had, for the women, a, a very strong senior-heavy group that was very, you know, that their strength was organization and management. That was something that they were great at, which they still had that at the younger ages, but, again, self-assured. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't there yet. But then on the men's side, this season, we have some incoming freshmen now that are like, I want to be involved. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm very passionate about X, Y, and Z. Can I do this? I'm like, yes. So that you're already doing this at 18. What's going to happen as you evolve and mature as a player and a person by the time you're a senior or a super senior? So uh, I think it's a case by case. Um, And here, too, we are – I'm definitely poking and pro- I'm poking the bear the entire time to make right. sure, like, hey, 
you can do it. Go ahead. Doesn't matter yeah. how old you are. You know, so it's it's always a work in progress. Yeah, I think you can see see it in them. You're like you you, you look at one person. You're like you're going to be like the mother of the family, so to speak, and mm -hmm. you're the one that's going to be doing the organization. And yeah, it's it is poking the bear a lot and just kind of like, come on, you got it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. All right, I, I want to roll into something that you, Nikki, kind of started talking about, and that's the differences between the groups. And I'm curious, there's a couple of different ways we can look at this, and I'm guessing that the most boring part of it would be if we wanted to talk about how you train them, because it sounds like it's probably pretty similar, it's but maybe same. some tactical differences here yeah. and there. But, but you know, and, I, and that's the answer I get almost any time I talk to coaches who coach both genders, like, oh, I coach them the same. I think yeah. the, 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 different, the, the area where you maybe start getting into differences is how you, you deal with them from a, an emotional personality sort of perspective and how they, they interact with you that might be different from the men's team to the women's team. So mm -hmm. why don't you extend to what you were saying before? Um, I'll say, you know, the, the small differences, like I, I, I like to say the guys are kind of like onions. Um, you, you know, you're peeling back certain layers here and there, and there's some that are already peeled that are like, yes, I'm comfortable. I, um, they, I'm trying to frame my, my thoughts here. The women, they're always apologizing. Uh, always apologizing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And for both teams, my rule is I'm not going to say sorry if I don't mean it. So there's been several times in practice where I have definitely said, I know I hurt your feelings. I'm not sorry because it's not personal. Um, this is business time and you're not a terrible human. You're just not playing well today. Um, and you can see the little nuances between both the men and women of like some of the girls will step back and kind of try to make themselves small. And, you know, I'm going to get back in the back of the group. And some of the guys do that too. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's all that connection on a personal level. Um, I'm a relationship coach. Um, that's how I run my gym, how I, that's how I recruit, that's how I, you know, connect with the, the players. And I don't make, I'm like, you don't have to have a personal relationship with me, but if I don't know you, how can I coach you? Um, and that's, uh, there's been different, mostly on the men's side. Um, the girls are very, you know, I think they look at me as most of the time, you know, mother figure, sister, friend, coach, life coach, stylist, I don't, all of the things. And it's, you know, that level of comfort that they already have because we're women, where the guys, it's kind of the same thing. Um, and there's been a lot of times where they're, I want your perspective on this because I'm not a macho guy or try to pretend to be macho or, you know, they want to talk about using conditioner or should I use conditioner? I'm like, yeah, you should. I, I think that's good. Yeah, and you should brush um, it. Sorry, my son is harassing me now, too. So we're talking about uh, men's and women's differences. Um, <laughs> the, the, the guys are just like right now. My son is 10 years old, and he's trying to harass me about using the iPad before it's time. <laughs> the guys will uh, <laughs> kind of poke and prod at you. There's a, a couple of the older ones that will, will bicker with me like we're a married couple. And I allow it because I tell them both that you're not robots and you're not, um, I respect your opinion, but the phrase that they're going to get a lot is like, you know what? I understand. Do what I say. That's it. <laughs> like we've had our banter. Um, and they respect that. They respect me. The guys are actually really pr protective of me. Um, not saying the women aren't, but it's a different level of, I don't know. It's, it's something that's, it's tangible, but you can't give it a name. And they're very concerned about my emotional state, about um, how I'm feeling, you know, carry her bags. Like, you know, but then, again, that makes me feel great because I'm like, that means you're going to carry your mom's bags, you're going to carry your sister's bags, you're going to carry, you know, open the door for someone, say thank you. Where the women, they're very loving and they want a hug and they want, you know, different things, and the guys do too. It, it, it's just, it, they're the same, but it's how, I'm, I'm approaching the women from this angle, I'm approaching the guys from this angle. Um, and it, it's kind of fun to try to figure them out, and I think over the course of 
past couple of years, I've learned that the kids that are coming in now, they're really comfortable. Where initially they're like, oh, Coach Nikki, Coach Nikki. I'm like, you can call me Nikki, it's fine. And now they're they're extremely like open and and I don't know if it's through the recruiting process, you know, or is it just the generation of kid that is coming through the, you know, the line. So, yeah. All right. What do you think, Craig? Um, the the one thing that stands out for me <laughs> is uh, for the women the majority. Again, not this is not a hundred percent of them, but the majority of them don't feel that they're really good, you know, and, and you've got to convince them that you, you're pretty good, you know, but they always seem like, oh, she's better, you know, or something like that. Where the guys, they always feel like they are the best thing on earth. And you got to tell them, like, dude, you're not that good. So it's <laughs> a little balance between that and that. Those two things really stand out. And honestly, the, the better women players that I've had have – had that mentality that the guys have a little bit like I'm the best person in this gym, you know? And so it's, that's been um, the, the big thing that stands out between the two teams for me. I'm the same thing. Like what Nikki said, I'm a huge uh, relationship coach. Um, you know, I always tell when I talk to recruits, um, I always tell them that I'm not a volleyball coach. Um, I'm a uh, coach uh, or I coach people to play volleyball, you know? So it's more about coaching the person. Um, and knowing who they are and, and what makes them tick and, you know, what's going to help them, what's going to hurt them, and, and really kind of getting that whole relationship down where same thing, life coach, parent, regular coach, uh, advisor, confidant, whatever they need uh, is kind of my role with them. And I think it, it just builds more trust on the court. It uh, allows you to be a little more free as a coach where, um, you know, you can coach them and they know it's coming from a place that you want them to be the best version of themselves and be as good as they possibly can be. Uh, after every practice, I tell both teams I love them um, and kind of go from there. If I forget, I get my chops busted big time. So, you know, and from both teams. So it's, it's something that we really um, try to focus on knowing what our players are about uh, and trying to, see how we can help them the best way possible. Uh, and again, I think it allows for, for a little more freedom as a coach to be able to just go out and coach and not have to worry about, um, you know, you could, you can be, you can be direct with them, not worry about tippy toeing around things or, you know, this is direct. This is what you're not doing. Well, this is what you're doing well. Um, so how can we make some changes? And then also just kind of getting conversation with them. Like you look like you're struggling what's going on. And then to, to have them actually, um, tell you like that's that's a big step you know I think a lot of times freshmen will come in they're like oh it's coach and they'll talk to their teammates first which is absolutely fine like I, if they can get their problem solved by the upperclassmen that's exactly what I want um, but I also want that comfortability where they can come up to me and say I'm having a personal problem here's what it is and then because they know that we're going to deal with it together you know so it's a relationship thing as well the, the two interesting things for me is I found that I will need to be a little bit more sharp with the guys from time to time because maybe they're goofing around a little bit more, maybe not being as focused. And it really gets me if, if you're goofing around and balls rolling on the court, so you're putting your teammates at risk. So those are times where I'm not, I don't tend to be a yelling coach, but if that happens, I'm going to be a yelling coach because now you got a safety issue. Right. So there's a bit more of that sort of thing with the guys. On the women's side, one of the interesting dynamics is is how some of the women don't want to stand out. Nikki, you kind of talked about the, the players who – or actually maybe, Craig, you talked about the player who kind of pulls to the back of the group um, and doesn't, doesn't want to stand forward. Uh, it, and even with leaders, because I even had a captain who was like this on the women's side, where she didn't, she didn't want – she wanted no praise. No praise in a group context. One on one, she was okay with it, but she didn't never wanted it in front of the group. She yeah. didn't want to stand out, kind of like the the, the nail sticks out gets hammered sort of sort of idea. Uh, and some of it was culture because I was dealing with players from a bunch of different countries at different times, and I laughed uh, at the idea of you know sorry sorry sorry. The English players, the English 
female players especially, it's like automatic. You know, you don't even have to do anything, and, and, and they're going to be saying sorry. And it was like, I had to put rules into place. Like, right. we got to stop this. This is just, this is getting crazy. Uh, <laughs> so I had to try to find ways of redirecting their language or something. Um, yeah. Sorry and thank you. Have you had to yeah. play, play you thank you during the middle of drills while you're trying to tell them, like, stop saying thank you. <laughs> stop saying thank you. <laughs> um, all right. We're, we're running up close to the hour. So the, the final topic that I wanted to bring up was leadership and you know how you handle the leadership in the groups if there's any different dynamics and and how that works within your teams uh, you know and what you do to to kind of address that so uh, Craig why don't you start with that one so I, a few years ago I don't know how many probably I don't know maybe 10 or 12 years ago I did away with captains uh, and I just had you know everybody's a leader and we just Everybody has a strength. We kind of go over a lot of strength things in the preseason, so individual uh, qualities that you can bring to the team. Uh, and we talk a lot about how those things can be helpful at certain situations uh, during the season or even out of season. So for me, um, I want to have as many leaders on the team as I possibly can, and, and that's what I'm coaching I'm, I'm, or teaching them to be a leader and be somebody who's going to make a difference once you leave this program. So for me, the idea of having a captain, um, it, it, I just tinkered with it, trying not to have it for a year. And it kind of took off a little bit. I felt like it just benefited our whole program, which is both teams better. Um, now, you know, with that being said, I would, you know, if I have to, you know, send a group text out, I'll, you know, I'll send it to like one or two people, but I'll move that around. If, if I have a business major who's, you know, wants to be uh, administration, you know, I'll say, okay, you get, I'll text her so that she can be the leader and learn how to like deal with a group of people and how you want them to do something or, or get a point across. So I try to be pretty cerebral as far as the assignments and the tasks and the roles I'm handing out to people that I feel like is going to fit what they're about and what they're looking to do with their uh, degree and with their, their life after college. So um, pretty beneficial. I haven't had a captain for a bunch of years now. Thank you. Um, on our side, uh, it, it's kind of taken shape of what Craig has done, um, but it can be earned. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe in senior captains. I also am a firm believer that everyone has some leadership quality. Um, we try to put them in situations where – you're going to thrive uh, because I, I think there's a big belief that if you're a captain, you have this power over everyone else. Like, yes, we do have people that are much more vocal. You know, I, the, the bulldogs of the team, I'm like, go, go enforce this right now. That's what was happening. It needs to come from someone else. That's your role. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make them a good captain. Um, I, and we try to foster that. Um, so last year we, on the women's side, we had something that we called the mastery. And it was mostly of, you know, we have a master of organization. We have a master of social, it was like social, um, social events, um, different categories within the team that you were in charge of or master of wardrobe. You know, you, you let us know what we're wearing and we're uniformed on a daily basis. Um, where the guys, I, they're a little bit different. Um, I let them have a small say. And like, okay, let's tell me what you think about your captains, but ultimately I'm picking who I believe is best. And then we have them in face-to-face -face meetings of like, hey, you voted for yourself. Why? Why is that? This is, uh, or you vote, we, we met, let them pick three. Um, why did you pick that person? And I'm like, okay, that makes a lot of sense that you picked X, Y, and Z person and you have done this. Okay. And that might convince me a little bit because ultimately you're the one convincing me. So I am a firm believer that if they have ownership of the team, the team can be ran a lot easier. And even though I might pick a captain, I want to know their input. And sometimes it, we don't agree. I was like, oh, they're a terrible captain. I'm like, have you given them a chance? If you haven't given them a chance as a captain because you're not a leader overnight, it takes a work in pro progress and you're going to fail. I'm like, I'm not always right. But I'm not. I'm also willing to admit that I've made mistakes. So it's always a, a process 
with especially with both of them. So it's just the guys get a little more pushback. The women they uh, want to be a little more, you know, friendly about it. But I, this year we had a, a senior who was not named the captain. She was kind of bummed, um, but she was our master of organization, and she was uh, going above and beyond for the team. So mid-season, I pulled her in front of the group, and I go, "This person has earned." her captain responsibility because she's exuding all of the qualities that you would look for in a leader. All, you know, and she was like really touched by that. And I was like, you earned it. I didn't, this wasn't an election. This was your hard work. So that's kind of how we, we leave it. 